right. I want to welcome you this afternoon. What a great group. Oh, my goodness. We have one, two, three seats left. Sold out crowd, which is kind of unusual when you're doing a historic lecture series. Um, I have some sheets. I'm Babette, by the way, the um, town historian and village historian. And I have some sheets on the back table. They are one sheet you can sign in and you can find out or get updates on our lecture series, historic lecture series. Also, um, I had decided that since the town agreed to do an inventory of barns, that I wanted an art exhibit and I wanted to write a book. And I thought, that's not my, my thing always to Jack Mirren is, how hard could that be? <laughs> and so I thought, you know, I talked to some of the people on in the Historic Advisory Committee and we came up with a list of maybe a dozen farming families. Then I put a post on things I remember about Victor, New York. And I got a list of all of those families that are listed on those papers on the back table. And then I thought, maybe this is going to be harder than I thought, and it's going to take a little longer. But what I need from you, and please spread the word, I need, if you are a farming family or if you know of farming families, you can add them to the list. I am in need of photos. And we are, our Historic Advisory Committee is going to be interviewing farming families, whether you did farm, still farming, leasing land. We want to document the um, barns and the agricultural history and farming families. And it probably will take a couple or three years, but that's the goal, to get that documented. So please look at um, the back table when when we're done with our program. I'd appreciate it because that's the only way we're going to get our information. And if you want to be in the book, you got to get in touch with me. All right. So today we're going to be uh, talking about the barns and the agricultural history of Victor. And then also we're going to have an artist's reception. You may have already noticed the beautiful watercolors that were done. And um, I will introduce the... Um, artist who is a Victor resident and also who is was the teacher of some of the artists that are actually here today. So the first farmers of course were the Senecas and they were members of the Haudenosaunee people of the Longhouse. They settled on Bowton Hill. Farming was done mainly by the women the three sisters, which you all must know, are the beans, the corn, and the squash, and they would grow them together. Lovely man. Because the French wanted control of the beaver trade, um, so they could have enough beaver to make felt hats. It was a big rage in Europe in the mid-1600s. So in 1687, they, they had tried to negotiate with the Senecas. And the Senecas uh, and the French couldn't come to an agreement because the Senecas felt that they were probably going to uh, overkill the beaver and therefore make it extinct. So they refused to do any kind of, a, of an agreement. So the French decided, well, if you can't agree, then the only thing we have left is take it from you. And so in 1687, Denonville, pictured here, uh, landed from New France. At that time, it was New France. It's now Canada. Uh, and he came down with his troops, landed at Arundacoit Bay, went down um, through Rochester, through uh, Pittsford and came to Victor and we think that he had a skirmish at the corner of Lane Road and Route uh, 96. He 
defeated the Senecas, which was kind of strange because they were a mighty, mighty tribe. But unfortunately, the men of the tribe at that time were out in Illinois fighting against the Illini. So the only people that were left here were the older women, men, and the children. But we don't have any documentation, written documentation, because they don't. At that time, they didn't write anything down. But that's where we think it was. So what did they, what, not only did they take the beaver trade, but they also, the, the Danan villainous troops, decided they would uh, burn all of the longhouses on Bowton Hill. And not only burn the houses, but also burn the food. This was the July of 1687, so they burned all their food, so they couldn't plant again. Um, we have samples of some of the burned corn. It's said that they burned a million um, bushels of corn. So they, were, they, were, they weren't even nice about what they did. Almost 100 years went by. And by that, or before, so the Senecas were, couldn't stay here, so they moved east to live with their cousins, the Cayugas. So the land atop Bowton Hill was just laid barren for 100 years until the um, Phelps and Gorham bought a million acres of land north, uh, bordered by Lake Ontario, south by Pennsylvania, east by the preemption line and west by the Genesee River. And they cut the, that land up into six mile square pieces. And Enos Bowton uh, bought, he was from Massachusetts, and he bought uh, the Victor six, eight, six square mile lot for uh, 20 cents an acre. In February 1790, Olive and Enos Bowton and their two children, one was two years old and one was four months old, came to settle in Victor. Now, this is 1790. Think about this woman. She's got two children. They decide to leave in February of 1790. Why did they leave in the winter? Because they thought it would be easier for a sled to go through the forests and over the, the rivers, over the lakes. Unfortunately, it was a mild winter. It took him about six weeks to get here. Think about how hard that was. Um, Olive couldn't just go to Wegmans. There was no hotels. Um, they camped out. Or they found a place, like they would come upon a farmhouse and ask to stay for the night. So those family members settled on Bowton Hill. That's why it's called Bowton Hill. And they had some family members that had come the year before to prepare. And they prepared a log cabin for Olive and Jared. They also planted buckwheat, wheat, and potatoes. Uh, exactly where the Senecas had once farmed. But unfortunately, only the wheat grew successfully. As more and more settlers arrived from mainly Massachusetts, um, the town grew. And just like any other town, it was an agricultural society. The main crop was wheat, but later on oats, potatoes, tobacco, and apples. Fishers would be known for being the seed, potato seed capital of the world. This is Valentown Hall. It was the original home of the Victor Grange. Now, the, we know, I think most of us know what the Grange was, but many people today have no clue. It was um, an organization that helped farmers get together. It was, it was like a social uh, event when they got together, but it was more than socializing. It was giving information, feeding uh, or filling each farmer's had with what are the best ways to 
plant this particular crop or how did this particular seed work for you so in 1875, Valentown Hall became the home of the Grange. Now, the Grange, Valentown Hall, was, is 80 feet long, 32 feet wide, and about 70 feet high. It's huge. It has a basement and three floors above the basement. And you can see that in the front of the building, there are a lot of doors. And the doors were, each door held a separate store. If you visit Valentown today, you can see that. On the second floor, they had grange rooms and an office and sitting rooms for people to socialize. And then on the third floor was a ballroom. By 1881, Victor farmers were sending 230 carloads of grain 83 carloads of apples, 450 carloads of potatoes from the Victor New York Central Station. That's about 450,000 bushels of produce. That station, you probably already know, is where um, railroads, Mickey Finn's used to be. Victor had a flour mill. And in 1876, it was on Railroad Avenue as well. It processed wheat grown by the local farmers, and it shipped out flour. Some of the names of the flour were King Flour, Victor Banner, Ontario Pride. This plant was destroyed by fire in 1937. And then um, in the 70s was the Victor Bean and Feed Company restaurant and the building until recently housed has always housed a restaurant there is also a victor preserving company that if you are a victor person you're i'm sure that you're very familiar with this it was begun on 19 in, in um, 1908 on school street fruit growers put in new orchards to meet the demand for dried and canned fruit in 1924 it was purchased and renamed the Victor Canning Company. And later it became the Victor Food Corporation. In 1946, it was the only company in the country that was making applesauce out of dehydrated apple nuggets, which were shipped from California because New York had a shortage of apples that year. We ha Victor has a lot of firsts. I mean, Fisher's being the largest seed potato producer in the country. This company doing applesauce, whereas nobody else did. Um, Victor insulators. You've got a lot of history in this town. Let's keep getting people to know that. As larger canning companies grew, the small independent canning company went out of business around 1957. With the growth of railroads and the ability to ship anywhere in the country, Victor's agricultural peak lasted from the 1870s into the early 20th century. A number of brokers, produce brokers, such as Leslie Loomis. Leslie Loomis had, had the, the yellow, the beautiful yellow house here on um, West Main Street. Oscar Polhemus and Seneca Bouton chip potatoes, grain crops, and fruit quickly and efficiently. This photo shows also the passenger station for the New York Central. And there's a hotel right across the way. By the 1920s, most produce dealers were closing down due to the decline of the potato industry. Nutrients in the soil were exhausted and improvements in varieties were go grown elsewhere. Also, there was no need for a dealer anymore because metropolitan brokers would send trucks to pick up crops in the fields. 
Dairy farming, though, at this time increased. Um, there were only about five dairy farmers, according to Marie Turner. She's a legendary Victor Herald reporter. Um, she would always write in her little notes in the Victor Herald every year when she saw the first what? Robin. Oh, it's like, okay. So five, she said there were only five dairy farmers in uh, the 1970s, and that would be, now I'm also going to put a little caveat here. Um, this program is only as good as the information I was able to get. You are going to be able to give me more information, I'm sure. So if you do have corrections, additions, please let me know. So she said, Frank Wiley on High Street with Guernsey cows, Burdette Benson, Benson Road Holstein cattle, Mike Berry, Church, or Cherry Street with Holsteins, John and Stanley Gillis with a small herd of Holsteins, and Arthur Brown, Murray Road with Holsteins. When the throughway was opened in Victor in 1946 and Route 490 in the early 1970s, the population of Victor exploded. And as Victor grew, the need for more housing grew. By the 1970s, farming as a way of life was disappearing. At the end of World War II, as many as 60 farmers in the town of Victor still raised dairy cattle and sold milk. It was cut in half by 1960. Our new agricultural enterprise, though, one new en enterprise did open in 1970, and that was the apple farm on Bowton Hill Road. High yield, high density dwarf apple trees were planted. And it was clear from the beginning that it would be a success. A fire in 2016 would cause the apple farm to close. It is now the orchard of Victor. In 1992, a report by the town of Victor, director of development, showed that those who responded to a resident survey wanted the rural character of Victor maintained, as well as keep the town's friendly atmosphere. But development of old farmlands was increasing. In 1986, the Snyder Wiley Farm on High Street was chosen for the annual Homerama Showcase, and Her Herefordshire Heights subdivision was built. And in the early 1990s, the town's largest subdivision at that time, Cobblestone Creek, was built on the rolling hilltop farmlands northwest of Gillis and Victor Egypt Roads. In 2008, Jean Gillis' sap house was on the Ontario County Historical Society's tour of barns. It is no longer viable, but you can still get maple syrup at Schaff Sugar Shack or Kettle Ridge Farms. So we're still, I mean, some have gone out, but at least some of these products are still um, being processed. Norm Sharp was a beekeeper in Fishers for over 40 years. He had as many as 2,000 hives. Today, Kettle Ridge has taken over for him and is still in Fishers. Victor has had, over the decades, scores of farmers and farming families. Two farms, however, the Gillis Farm and, on Gillis Road and the O'Neill Farm on Strong Road were nominated in 1976 as Century Farms, farms which had the distinction of being farmed by the same family for over 100 years. And I do believe that the O'Neills, they're still farming, right? No, Steve? Nope. Helen Gillis, um, at 23, she was the daughter of a farmer. She kept a diary about a Victor farm 
in the 1870s. And I just thought I'd read a couple of her um, things that she had written in her diary. March 22nd, we have been talking about the art of farming and arrived at the conclusion that it is an art. April 1st, we have made 100 pounds of maple sugar. How, how that is a lot of maple sugar. A lot of work. June 12th, the old routine over and over again. One scarcely marks the past time, time on this farm. So near alike are all the days and weeks. And one more. August 15th, threshed 400 bushels of wheat and sold it the next week for $1.54 a bushel. $466 for it. This is in the 1870s. I think that's pretty good money. <laughs> As part of any agricultural history, barns are integral with many sizes and shapes. You may or may not know that the town board has asked the Landmark Society of Western New York to do an inventory of all the existing barns in Victor. Over the last 20 years, Victor's lost about 30% of its barns. Barns are an important part of our history. And at the end of this presentation, I'll share a way barn owners can help keeping their barns viable. The, the pictures that I'm going to show you of the, these barns are barns that are in Victor. Um, and I've tried very hard when, I've, um, when I'm talking about getting and giving information that all the barns are pictures of barns in Victor. Our inventory is not complete yet. It won't be done until January. So we're still working on the, the barns inventory. Um, there's very common barn styles. Uh, Gable, Gambrel, uh, Moniker and gable. The most common types in Victor are the gable style, which is the first one. So this just tells you what a gable is. There's a gable roof. It's m like more like an upside down V. Um, and the gambro roof, which has two slopes, the, the uh, lower one usually being steeper than the upper one. So why are barns painted red? You'll notice that Victor's barns are painted white, yellow, red, blue, but traditionally the color is red. Hundreds of years ago, farmers painted their barns with linseed oil to help seal the wood and keep it from rotting. Rust was mixed with the oil to keep fungi and moss from growing on the wood. So this turned the oil red. And that's why barns are painted red in honor of that tradition. That was new information for me. I just thought red was a pretty color. <laughs> so here we are. We're going to be talking about uh, Victor and honoring its agricultural history and its barns. Buildings that have been part of our community for over 230 years. Some are worn and tired. Some have been lost to fire, demolition. Some are surviving better. Some even becoming homes. Our oldest barns stay back to 1800, which is pretty remarkable since the Boutons were here in 1790. Um, their barns probably were very small, shed-like places. Um, we have, th these barns have survived. Uh, they're found on High Street, um, Boughton Hill, Brownsville, and Willis Hill. Um, this is documentation that was given through assessment records. Again, here's a gambler roof, and you can 
see that it's got a double pitch. There's wagon doors on the long side. It's built with or without a basement, and it can have multiple bays. These are just some examples of, of Barnes and Victor with Gambrel roofs. They, uh, Gambrel increased the storage capacity of the loft from the gable roof. This is an, an important development to, for as farmers began to accumulate larger herds and needed to store enough food to feed them during the winter. This barn has come to epitomize the classic American barn. So the gable uh, roof barn has also been called an English barn. And um, it's usually entered through its long sides, through doors opening into a center, center bay. And then the center bay served as a threshing floor and a wagon runway. One of the bays may have housed cows, another oxen, horses, and then hay or straw was stored on poles in the loft. Here are some examples from Victor. Despite the fact that it does carry the name of an English barn, the English barn style was created in America. So I guess because they were English people, they just, instead of calling it the American barn, they called it uh, English barn. This style was about being very minimalistic, practical, and it suited the early colonists. And then, of course, you have barns that have ramps. And the ramps uh, were built into a natural bank, usually, so wagons could access the top floor of the barn. So you'd go in. I am no farmer, but I'm going to try this. You go in, and then your wagons would be on the second floor. You unload the hay. Your horses and your animals would be on the, on the bottom floor. Um, also, it was important that the, there was a cupola on the top, which would get air circulation through the barn. And um, the upper level of the loft was used for hay storage. And in locations where the terrain was hilly, the basement was built into the hillside. The locations of the doors and the ramps to the upper levels were determined by the terrain. Here's a couple of Victor barns that have ramps. Another type of barn building was the Quonset. Um, the Quonset huts were first manufactured in 1941 when the United States Navy needed an all-purpose, lightweight building that could be shipped anywhere and assembled without skilled labor. This barn on the Gillis property has a clear span design, which means no beams or trusses are required. This, this allows you to have the most space possible. Now, other barn types, which are kind of rare, especially in Victor, are the Gothic, Italianate, and Greek Revival. These two barns show some characteristics of Italianate and Gothic with their steep cross gables. Um, haven't don't have a picture of a Greek Revival. This next picture is just, I had to put it in because it is just a very unique barn. Um, I think it's over on Bordel Road in that area. I don't know what kind of, you, what you, you just call it a very large barn. Barn foundations can be a mixture of small and large rocks, but carefully placed to provide the stability and likely originally covered with mortar, made with cobblestones or field stones or rock piers, even concrete. 
though usually you can tell the age of a barn by its foundation. Um, the original ones would have been cobblestones and field stones, um, later ones, some even old barns have some concrete because they needed to be um, fixed. There's other buildings that would be on a, a farm, such as smokehouses and corn cribs, chicken coops. And then there are silos. Uh, Fred Hatch of McHenry County, Illinois, is credited with the first upright silo. He built it in 1873. I was surprised at that because I, would, I thought that that would have been something that would have been invented a lot earlier than this. Some early silos were built within barns, but problems of proper ventilation and cleaning led to the use of an external square silo attached to the barn. A drawback of the square silo was that the silage in the corners tended to cake and rot. By the 1900s, the round wooden silo was introduced and made of upright staves held together with adjustable iron hoops. The round silo made from spruce or pine quickly became the standard. Stone, brick, and ceramic silos were also built until precast concrete and steel became the materials by the mid 20th century. Here's just some photos of the insides of our barns, uh, some of the older barns, noting the foundation stones, the rough hewn bar, uh, beams, interior roof, and walls. And another thing that um, I didn't realize is that doors at first were not hinged. The, when barns were first built, the doors had to be removed in the summer and replaced in the winter. But the roller door was introduced and they were the type of door that were originally used on freight cars. So when the train started using those rolling doors, Farmers thought that this is a much better idea, so let, they started using that. Windows may have been added after the early 1800s, and windows gave us a clue, or give us a clue, to what a barn may have been used for. For example, the barn in the middle was a dairy barn, because it has lower windows. Cupolas were also added for ventilation. And then there were those owl holes. They were four to six inches in diameter, usually round, in the barn peaks so that owls would have easy access to help rid the barn of those nasty mice and other rodents. So this year, barn owners found out that uh, last May, May of 2022, New York State passed a barn rehabilitation tax credit. And it is one of the ways that the state is trying to help barn owners. And it's through the Historic Barn Rehabilitation Tax Credit. And information on that is on the back table. If you have any of you um, applied for that? Because I had a meeting in January with uh, the barn owners, and they were quite interested in this. This is the, the um, we had something for historic barns but that the state had done early 2010, 15, but it wasn't a tax credit. It was a, it was a grant that, they, that you applied for, and you got $25,000 but you had to be on the scenic byway. I mean, there was all sorts of stipulations. This is, you apply for this, and you get a, a tax credit. Um, and I believe you can apply for, for up to $5,000 tax credit. So it's for anybody in New York State. So there's 
lots of books on barns. And um, as I said before, I want to put a book together in Victor's agricultural history and farming families. And the, the list that I have on the back table may or may not be accurate, but I would appreciate it if you'd look at the list. And I know that there are several of you that have a, a really good um, background in farming and, you, and you've lived in Victor all your life and you know who those families were or are. So cross out names that are not correct because I, like I said, I got them off the things I remember about Victor Facebook page. And if they're in Farmington, unfortunately, they have to be taken off because I, I'm doing Victor. Um, my business card is back on the table as well. So if you, you know, take it, give it to people. I need to get the information in order to do a book. So one of the young people on my historic advisory committee, Victoria Bender, um, I have to give her a special thank you because I had a list of all these farming families and I said, Victoria, wouldn't it be great if somebody could make a barn picture and have the names of those farming families in it? She said, I could do that. Of course, she's like 30. So um, she did. And I was, it, it's just the coolest, um, I don't know, photo that I have seen yet. Uh, we're going to, add, she said she can edit it. We can add to it if we need to. Um, so now I'd like to introduce to you um, Larry Keefe. And Larry is a, a watercolor, watercolor painter and also the teacher is a teacher of watercolor for the Finger Lakes watercolor group. And he's going to introduce the artists that did those beautiful watercolors for us uh, of Victor Barnes. And also, after he introduces them, um, please feel free to talk with them about their watercolors. Um, we also have um, Larry's, he's got some watercolor paintings that are in the back um, foyer as you go out the back door. So take a look at his as well. Um, all right, Larry, I'm going to have you come up here. He's a very shy person. And then I uh, invite you to have some cookies and lemonade or um, iced tea afterwards as you're talking to people and learning about their wonderful abilities. Well, I'm Larry, and uh, um, I teach uh, watercolor at the uh, <coughs> Memorial Art Gallery, and I've been doing that for a number of years now. and. Um, I'm a Victor native uh, all my life, and my great-grandfather originally settled here. Uh, so I grew up in, in Victor, and uh, it's very dear to my heart. Uh, not sure what to say about this, except that at a certain point, I was talking to Babette, and she mentioned this, and she uh, knew that I was a watercolor painter and I had some students and, and we talked about uh, the idea of putting together a project. Uh, and as a result uh, of that, I asked this group of my students who have, uh, most of them get together and paint every other uh, uh, week the Finger Lakes watercolor painters, we rather pretentiously call ourselves. Uh, but we get together and uh, do group critiques, and we decided that we would take on the, um, 
the project of painting some of the barns of Victor. So Babette gave us uh, a list of sites and we went out and, uh, and each of the artists, uh, not each of the artists, but many of the artists picked out places that they wanted to paint. So um, a lot of them are here today and I'll, uh, I'll just introduce them very, very briefly. Their work probably introduces them better than I can. So I invite you to take a look at them and if you're interested uh, in buying any of those paintings, you can uh, contact the artist directly from the, uh, uh, their contact information is up there. Um, let's see. So, um, can I have everybody stand up and I'll introduce you? Uh, let's see, we've got Laura Bender and Marilyn Monkelbaum and um, what? Karen DeSantis, yes. And um, I blank on names, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Suzanne Demers and Amy Annis. Uh, uh, they all have here. Uh, paintings here. And Rory. And um, I think you'll, some of this work has been developed very specifically uh, through multiple iterations. And I think it's, uh, I think it's artistically quite a nice uh, group of paintings. So we're very appreciative of the opportunity to, uh, to show it here. Thank you. And we, we had the town meeting room all newly painted. We had a, a thermostat, thermostat, you know, one of those that sticks at the wall about this far. We had that capped over. And so that whole wall was just a perfect place to put those beautiful paintings. So. Um, the artists will be by their paintings. Uh, we have other paintings behind these screens that were done by other Victor artists. And uh, we also, like I said, have Larry's out in the, um, the vestibule towards the back of the um, town hall. So does anybody have any questions? Thank you all for coming today. Appreciate it very much.